I know the kind of pain you're feeling, Alex. I once had it myself. You some kind of doctor? No, Alex. I am Magneto, and I have come to offer you sanctuary. Welcome to Season 3 of the Grounded Futures Podcast. This is the show where we discuss topics that are important to our collective survival and thrival. We also dig into ways youth, and anyone really, can gain new skills to thrive amid current and ongoing disasters. This season's meta theme is all about trust. Trust in ourselves, trust in our work and art, and trust in each other. We are your hosts, William and Carla. Welcome to our show. Uh, we produce Grounded Futures on Squamish, Musqueam, and Salatooth lands, but our guests are from around the world. A big thank you to Zach Bergman for our show music, and a big thank you to Robin Carrico for our show art. And before we start today's show, here's a short jingle from one of our pals over at Channel Zero Network. Hello, and welcome to We Will Remember Freedom, a monthly podcast of anarchist fiction. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to Live Like the World is Dying, your podcast for what feels like the end times. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. Hello, and welcome to The Jingle for both of my podcasts. I'm your host, Margaret Kiljoy. You can find my podcasts wherever you get your podcasts or get them from the Channel Zero Network. Lynn's Amer creates LGBTQ plus and intersectional social justice media for kids and families. They created their beloved LGBTQ plus family web series, Queer Kid Stuff, in 2016, which now has 4 million lifetime views and counting. Their debut book, Rainbow Parenting, Your Guide to Raising Queer Kids and Their Allies, publishing on May 30th, 2023 with St. Martin's Press. Currently, they host the Rainbow Parenting Podcast and perform at schools and libraries across the country, while also writing and consulting for children's television. They worked with Nick Jr. on the Webb Award-winning Blues Clues and You, a Pride Parade music video. The fabulous show with Faye and Fluffy on upcoming episode of an extremely popular show and more. You can watch their TED Talk on why kids need to learn about gender and sexuality now with more than 2.5 million views. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me and for that lovely introduction. (laughs) (laughs) So many good things. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot going on. (laughs) How are you doing today? I am doing good. Things are wild. Um, my schedule is is just like one of those times when it just like picked up really quickly. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. I'm just like, Ugh, so right. many things to juggle all at the same time. But uh, today is uh, today's been good. So good. yeah. Well, thanks for joining That's us good. during yeah. such a extraordinarily busy you time. Know- I love coming on podcasts and chatting with cool people. So this is a, <laughs> a lovely little end of my day. Okay, yeah, good. Perfect. Right. That's perfect. All right. Do you want to start off? Yeah, I'll start off with the first question then. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Before we dig into your work on Queer Kids Stuff, the podcast, and the Rainbow Parenting book, and so on, we have a question for you. Our show opens with Magneto rescuing a kid and offering him sanctuary. And we were scrolling through your Twitter feed and saw a tweet from last summer where you wrote the X-Men owe Magneto an apology. Let's go into the nerdverse of Magneto and why do you feel that? Oh my god, I can't believe you scrolled all the way back to our Twitter <laughs> feed. Carla and I talked about your Magneto essay in the Trust Kids book when we were on my podcast. And uh, yeah, the Magneto obsession dates way back to before reading that. Um yeah. Yeah, Magneto was right. <laughs> is the <laughs> is the short of it all? Um, what was the question again? Uh, it was just, just like, like the ending bit. Why do you feel that way about? Why it? do I feel that way? Hey, what is um, X Men? Oh, Magneto and, and an apology. Yeah. Oh man. Um, mm. oh, because he was traumatized and from the Holocaust, <laughs> and there was just so little grace for his radicalism coming out of such a violent experience for him and in his 
essentially triggered response to what was happening what's happening kind of like currently in the and i'm i'm a kind of a movie person on the x-men thing i'm not really in the comics um so that's i don't have a lot of um <laughs> background in in that side of the storytelling of it all but at least from the like first m- movies and those are i i'm a millennial i grew up on those films and superhero stuff and uh yeah watching Watching it back now as an adult, I did like a rewatch of like all of the X-Men movies a couple of end of 2022-ish. And I the the trauma that he in particular suffered from the Holocaust that then gets pulled back into his life in a really profound way through the, through the movies and through the kind of modern story of it all is just... Uh, it's really intense and like and it just gives so much context for all of his decisions and as a jewish and trans person it's just become even more profound and i think it goes beyond even the parallels to martin luther king jr and malcolm x i think it's i think it that's like a helpful starting place to like think about it but I think that there's also the context that we have now on those two political historical figures, right? Of like COINTELPRO and like that they actually were friends and that they um, were supportive of each other's missions and our, our white supremacist history has pitted them against each other. And it's interesting to take all of that context to the X-Men movies and see yeah i think i don't think that xavier was like totally wrong and i think your essay got at that too but i do think that like it's so important to think about okay how can these two philosophies of organizing right uh work with and for each other instead of pinning them against each other this is all getting into conversations about coalition and (laughs) um way to kick off the podcast with the holocaust (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> i mean we asked the questions so about it's that great and, it's great <laughs> yeah it's awesome yeah no i uh that that's a great answer yeah i uh grew up watching the x-men movies a bit and i've always been a fan of magneto he's always been mm-hmm. one of my favorites um because it's like like you say with the trauma with the trauma and stuff like that like that's mm-hmm. that's totally that's totally part of it for sure. And I think like also like finding other um, mutants and then they're all like doing what Xavier's doing of kind of kind of following in the capitalism, kind of doing the thing that's like, it's like he's not entirely wrong because he's getting the support and he's doing the things to like make sure everyone's safe and stuff. But they're safe but are they free (laughs) you know it's like and Mm. magneto is like he's not exactly safe in the in some of the choices he's made but he feels Mm -hmm. free Mm. the people that follow him feel more free and stuff and i think that's yeah it's a cool i like that frame and he's i mean the canon yeah i was just gonna say i was like i was like i totally i don't know how much i was just like oh yeah magneto when i was a kid (laughs) but like but i also think that like i've always been drawn to villain characters because villains for the most part are queer coded Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. and i mean that's a very complicated long conversation yes yeah Um, (laughs) we don't need to go into the uh the fact that all uh, villains and shows are usually either queer or people of color or... <laughs> yeah but the thing that i think that folks don't think about always when we're talking about queer coding of villains that that i that relates back to my work is mm-hmm. that especially when you're looking at like disney movies and the queer coding of the villains in animated films and the history of that a big reason why that happened is because a lot of the animators behind those characters were queer and couldn't mm. express their queerness yes. in their art. And so it ended up it being, the, yeah. exactly, they put it into the their artwork in the way that they could because they could code it as, they could code villains as queer and like fabulous like Ursula is, a, is an yeah. incredible yes. example of this yeah. Um, yeah. based on the drag queen well, even even uh, uh the one from Lion King 
uh, uh scar brother. Yeah, scar yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like he he the way he sings is like oh it's yeah so queer <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love this oh i hope you write something about this or maybe you already have because there's an essay going around right now i don't know if you've seen it i have i, I was actually so irritated i couldn't even open it but it's some mm. and it's probably in the terrible new york times but it said something about uh, how dan- we're in these dangerous times of rewriting uh, villains as as heroes was the headline mm. and I was like immediately was like I this is gonna be terrible <laughs> yeah terrible. I feel like yeah. Ugh, gosh yeah it's such a complicated thing I, I feel like it's that um you know that meme where it's like the brain like gets like bigger and bigger yeah, and like goes more down the slots yeah and, it goes yeah. down the slots and I'm just kind of like okay this is like villains like are awful bad people the black and, and white then, thing, yeah. yeah exactly and then it's like villains are queer coded that's <laughs> like cool because there's representation then it's like queer co- villains are bad because that's that's coding queer people as evil and then it's like oh that's the only way the queer animators could express themselves <laughs> yeah. in the 50s and 60s <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 no, love totally. it. That's, I love that's, it. that's perfect such a good yeah i hope yeah it's <laughs> better at making I think I need to get better at making memes. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah, memes are so powerful. Um, yeah, hilarious. Well, yay Magneto! Thank you. For yeah, yay Magneto us. for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. And just little side note: Stan Lee himself didn't see him as a villain as such. Um, no. uh, antagonist, a, a more antagonist, more um, a little bit of an antihero maybe, but not a villain. Mm. Um, he was really clear about that. Um, mm, so cool. I think yeah, that's Stan Lee also. Yeah. Rad fans very heavily ship him with Xavier, and it's great. I love it. Because the movies, especially um, Patrick Stewart and uh, yeah. yeah, and they're like best uh, friends. They're yeah. like best friends, yeah. Yeah, and one of them buzz. is queer, and yeah. they're just like yeah. so. It's so queer on 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 screen. It's so great. Uh, I, I love Mc- those Mc- too. Sir Ian. <laughs> yeah, Sir Ian McKellen. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, they're okay. they're a good dynamic duo. I love yeah, that. they are. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks for starting off with the nerd verse with us. Oh my um, god, we couldn't help because our show opens with a Magneto voice. Oh yeah, yeah I love it. Sanctuary. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk a bit about your fabulous book that's coming out in May because I was privileged to have an advanced copy and it was such a joy to read and mm. um, inspiring. And thank you for your work. Um, it's called Rainbow Parenting: Your Guide to Raising Queer Kids. Um, and, and their, their allies. allies and their allies that's important um, it's an important that's part. a really important part sorry i had a like space on my page <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna read it again rainbow parenting your guide to raising queer kids and their allies mm. and you begin the book with your mission statement spread queer joy in there you write queer for me and my life has been the center the rule not the exception and joy is unbridled happiness kindness rainbows unicorns glitter and the best of our collective wildest imaginations so much is held in these three words spread queer joy they are the blanket that confronts the shield that protects the glitter that glimmers and the balm that heals oh so i just like oh I had to read it Um, and just give the audience, you know, the people listening, uh, just a little taste of your writing. It's so beautiful. It also has a lot of humor in it. Um, But anyways. Which is perfect. I am Jewish. I like to be funny. (laughs) Yes, Yes, exactly. Humor is just, it's just weaved through every, every page. Um, Humor keeps people alive. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Even people in the darkest situation. Oh, did my mic just turn off? I don't think so. I, oh, no. I, 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 nope. Okay. <laughs> I can hear you. I can't hear myself oh. anymore. So no, you're really oh, loud. You're good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, even people in like the darkest yeah. situations make humor. Yeah. So it's absolutely. Perfect. We're also um, trying to be entertaining and relatable and accessible. There's, exactly. Yeah. It's such yeah. an accessible book. Um, good, and good. It's, thank you for doing it. I want, yeah. Can you mm-hmm. t- maybe tell us about the book, why you mm-hmm. did it, and maybe some of your hopes for it as it's making its debut onto the world? Yeah. Yeah, it's coming out May 30th, which is just inching closer and closer every day, which is equal parts exciting and terrifying. <laughs> um, yeah, the book, I've, uh, where do I even start? Um, I feel like the seed of the book really started with my TED Talk. Um, so I did a TED Talk in summer of 2019, and that did well and was like a one of those bucket list check mark things to check off and and people seem to um 
uh, it spoke to people, I think. And I went to my literary agent who I had um, signed with, I think like a year or two prior because I had wanted to um, publish a picture book. Um, and that uh, takes a lot longer and is a lot harder to do, <laughs> which we discovered. And I was like, I have this literary agent. I want to like, I want to write, I want to write a book, whether that's a picture book or like, I was like, maybe I could do a nonfiction something. And I kind of saw the reaction to the TED talk and I was like, hmm, maybe I could turn this into a book. And then we started writing the proposal because I don't know how many people know this, but most nonfiction books are bought on proposal. You don't have to write the full manuscript, which is different than fiction. Um, and it took a long time to get the proposal together because I had never written a nonfiction proposal. And then the pandemic hit and lockdown happened and slowed everything down, especially the already glacial publishing industry. And then we ended up kind of still putting it together somehow and went out on submission with it to put it out to different publishers and, and editors in, I want to say like January, February of 2021. And from there... Everybody passed on it, by the way, <laughs> except for maybe one person. And we got kind of like notes back. And so I had to revise the proposal. And the proposal at this point does not at all reflect what the <laughs> final version of the book is. Um, I think it's a much better book for it. Um, but yeah, and I've been working on it ever since. We, we officially sold it in March of 2021. And... Have, I've been writing it pretty much ever since. It's, uh, yeah, two years almost after. Oh my gosh. Yeah, right now, when we're recording this, March of 2023 is uh, about two years since I sold it. Um, and then it's going to come out in May. So that's wild. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it, calling it a parenting book is more for marketing than it is for a reflection of what's in the book. It's a bit of a misnomer because it's not a parenting guide like you would look at what to expect when you're expecting or like anything that's like super practical about like this is when your baby's gonna start smiling and things like that. Um, uh, it this I would say that this book is more of a philosophy um, on like how to raise young people in a way that is queer and gender affirming. And that is just like through a lot of different ways. So through their environment, through the language that you use around them throughout and it, and it kind of takes it section by section through the different kind of like age phases of early childhood. So from infancy to toddlerhood, there's a specific chapter on kind of like preschool age because that's a very significant age that like three, four age um, that it's very significant in learning about gender and gender identity. Um, or at least I want people to be thinking that it's a significant age to be getting that information to their kids. Um that's yeah that's the <laughs> tactic of it all right um getting behind the scenes a little bit and then um it goes kind of like kindergarten plus so kind of moving out of early childhood and into like, like more complicated things um and that's all that's kind of like the meat of the book but preface to sorry that's my mic um preface to all of that there's a really chunky section of just like completely stripping down the reader's stigmas around queerness and transness and childhood and that was a really really important thing to do because the way I like to think of the book is like all right we got a big pool of stuff that we got to wade through right and I am your guide who is going to very slowly step by step lead you into the deep end we're not diving straight into the 10 foot side of the pool we're gonna walk nice and slow I'm gonna hold your hand and we're gonna go inch by inch and as you know <laughs> before you know it you're gonna be you know nose deep in water and you're not even going to notice it happened. Um, that's kind of the 
how the book should feel. But Carla, you've read the book and not a lot of people have read the book yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been reading it over and over again for the past two years. Oh, so yeah. I mean, you've curious. captured it. Yeah, it's um, I think it's really important. The part about the it's not just it's not really just for parents or parenting in that way. Mm -hmm. And I would even yeah. push it. It's like really about relationships Mm -hmm. between um, folks who support young people so in any place public or private I really kept yes. I really just can, yeah it really um, was an invitation to anybody who's mm -hmm. um, maybe in the adult zone of their life um, yeah and anyone and space yeah yep. anyone who is in relationship with young people exactly really anyway yeah and yeah. yeah thinking of parenting not as like child parent but as in like the relationship between um, people who theoretically raise children. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and you you also did a beautiful job of weaving in the intersections of oppression and other systems of oppression um, without being didactic. It was just it's just so beautiful. Thank you. Uh, and like I said, there's humor, and it, there it, you know you, your man, your mission statement of queer joy is is what the book is. Like it's mm -hmm. it's on every page. It is it is the ethos that runs through it, and um, it's just stunning. Um, Thank and I'm not you. always. I mean, I think that you know I want people who know my work well know that I don't always I'm not a personally go. I I don't I don't write handbooks um, per se, and so for like it's genuine when I say this is like doing something unique and and beautiful, mm -hmm. and it is really getting to that nuance between the difference of being a guide and mm -hmm. a didactic stand above everybody's teacher um, or professing. So it's it really is um, you're walking with people and you really feel it. Um, oh, thank yeah, you. That thank really you. means a lot because it's true. <laughs> it was really. <laughs> It was really hard. To write I know. This book. Oh, it was bet. really hard because it is, there is that really in that tension that I felt as I was writing it between like being too prescriptive versus mm -hmm. like really approaching it as a philosophy. And like, there are some things that I do have to explain and explain how to explain. And that's like already hard, but I'm also trying to like talk about like my own personal experience, just like growing up as a trans person and like my experience working with young people, whether they're a queer or trans or whatever. And it's uh, weaving all of that together. Oh my gosh, this book took so much out of me. <laughs> um, but I hope that it, that all of that effort speaks to the page and like it's, useful is 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 all that I can really hope for and I think the dedication that I have at the beginning of the book really says it all um if you want to read that you don't have do you have that in front of you have it oh I it's, um, I'm sorry <laughs> I you no, know okay. I, t I I I did have it because I was like I was going to read it because you're right it is so beautiful but I would love you to say it <laughs> yeah um my dedication at the top of the book is it says for trans kids I hope this helps mm. And that is about as true and honest as I can be is that like, I wrote this book because I hope that it changes things and I don't want to be so hubristic that I think that it like will so change the trajectory of everything that's going on right now, but I hope I can at least make some sort of dent because this is a book with a big five publisher and it's got reach and it's in, it's publishing in a moment that I think is really, this has always been the intersections of queerness, transness, and kids and like visibility of that those intersections have always been hot and spicy and that this I, I talk about this a lot in therapy of just like the double-edged sword of my work where like I get to put out this like beautiful stuff into the world and it's met with so much love but also so much hate and that is just the nature of what I do and there's no real escape from that and I just hope that like we're able to hit the nail in a way that like we can really make something happen and get this like 
essentially new parenting philosophy, new child raising philosophy into the world in a significant way. Like I want, and I think my publisher wants this book to be the book you get for every one of your friends when they're having a baby shower. Like that is like, this is the book that you get when you're getting someone what to expect when you're expecting. And yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, that was beautiful. That was really beautiful. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> yeah. And it will, it will. It's going to yeah, spread. Um, 100%. Uh, it's going to have ripple effects beyond like you uh, just, you won't even probably see that the multitudes of lives that are going to be changed um, because it's going to be so massive. Um, and those things are subtle, like the private home and the private lives of folks doesn't always make it to the internets because mm -hmm. that's where the extremes are. Yeah. Um, so just, I just know it. I, it's just, thank it's going to reach people. It's going to reach the right, reach the right people. And, but and it's just going to spread. Yeah. Like We're manifesting that. it together in this conversation. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. 100%. Yeah. And it's, it's really, you can tell that you wrote it a little bit. I don't know. I don't want to assume this, but I feel like it was like, must've been so healing. Like you, you were writing it for yourself for little you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that like, I mean, that's, that's the thing with like I think a lot of my work is that there's like a healing about it and it's not necessarily something I do on purpose I don't like write something in order to heal myself but like or I mean sometimes I do but um I think like it's that's something that I've started to notice more about my work especially like as I as a human have worked on healing is I can see the ways in which my like creativity helped me heal as like a part of that journey for myself, but also like how, because that happens for me when I am creative in these ways, it also helps other people heal. Um, so that's just kind of like an interesting thing that started happening in my work that I think has been happening for a long time and people have communicated to that to me for a very long time. I just didn't know how to tune into that um for a while and I think I've finally like found that frequency um yeah I hope that I hope that I can put a little bit of healing out into the world because I think we just need a lot more of that Absolutely. I think there are a lot of hurt people will, out, will there. That out there yeah 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 100 percent. Yeah. it's really beautiful <laughs> Yeah. Oh, should I move on to the, okay. Yeah. So they're connected. <laughs> yeah. They're connected. Yeah. It's connected. So <laughs> this is a pile of different things that we'll okay. go into. Okay. I had a chance to read some of the episodes of watch. our watch, not read. Well, <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. I had a chance to watch some of the episodes of queer kids stuff and it's super fun and accessible. Um, I love that it's really for all ages, like any, any age can watch it really. And it's just, yeah, thank you for doing that. I wish I had it when I was a kid because it is, uh, it's amazing. Um, and it makes me want to highlight some of the gender and queer affirming moments too, because part of dominant culture narrative is to keep us queer folks as experiencing fear and other things in the world of just feeling in that oh, we're hated by everyone and everyone and blah, 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 blah. That's not us. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, would love to hear your thoughts on that. But also here's two other uh, topics I'd like to talk with you about and hear from you on. Uh, and I will go into these eventually. One is how you use anti-trans versus transphobia. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to hear about why <laughs> you do that. And the other yeah. topics is... Uh, this one I'll, I'll delve into on personal story stuff of mm -hmm. intersections between sexism and anti-gay stuff and that connected mm -hmm. to transphobia. Ooh, that's an interesting yeah. one. I'll we talk can... about my, cause I, no one can see me, but I pass really well. Mm -hmm. So I, I deal with my own things that, uh. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm excited to dig into that. That is a <laughs> complicated and interesting inside baseball. And I love inside baseball. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, um, I was, uh, yeah, wanted to, uh, I guess, ask about the anti-trans versus transphobia. And... Sure. Did you want to get to the web series first? 
Oh yeah, we can do that first. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah, like yeah. that was a multifaceted question. Yeah. Usually I asked that question, but Liam really took on that today. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. I love it. Yeah. Um yeah. queer I love what you're talking about with queer kid stuff and that like the all ages aspect of it, because that's something I talk about all the time. Because I think that like the secret to good kids work is that it's intergenerational. And I think like that is a really important piece of what I do because what you're talking about of this like fear mongering and isolation of queer people it's about not just like isolating from each other but isolating us between generations right so that we cannot raise new generations of queer and trans people which is what we're seeing happening right now politically right an attack literally on young trans and queer kids so that they don't grow up to be queer and trans adults right that is the point of all of this um but to just so we can't get knowledge from our in community elders right and i i'm not trying to like position myself as an elder because i'm not in the queer and trans community but like i have had experiences and I am older than a five-year-old right and I have more knowledge than a five-year-old and am in community in different ways than a five-year-old is and but that's also true for a 91 year old in community or out of community and it's about stitching our community back together right from like being this like quilt that's been torn apart and sectioned off into these spaces um here you're a queer trans elder one you're going to be oppressed by ageism and shoved into you know nursing homes maybe you're you're lucky and you're in sage and you're in lgbtq plus community um i mean so many lgbtq plus elders didn't survive the aids crisis right so like there's i mean <laughs> bringing it back to genocide right um and i mean that that's something that the jewish community has been through that the that indigenous communities have been through it's something that really tears apart you know systems of knowledge right and histories and that is a really profound loss and that's something that you have to actively work to rebuild and i think like if we're gonna get macro with it right like that's kind of what i'm trying to do is like get us back in touch with young people so that we can rebuild an intergenerational queer and trans community right because that's how we survive <laughs> is we have people around us and we support each other in these oppressive systems that don't want us to survive and don't want us to continue to raise young people into our spaces and don't want us to take care of the oldest among us who have the knowledge of how to get through these oppressive times because they've lived through it before they've survived the AIDS crisis they've survived the holocaust they have we will one day hopefully be elders who survived this political onslaught uh, against trans people like it history happens i'm not a historian but like history happens in cycles right and like we can learn really important lessons from the people who came before us and the oppressors know that if we don't have access to that knowledge we can't stop them and i think you know queer kid stuff is just like a preschool series where i'm talking with my teddy bear and a ukulele about like what does the word queer mean and that episode is like the very first episode of the series and it comes directly from the queer theory classes that i was taking like in college and that's like how do you put bell hooks into a preschool show and like that episode is how I tried to do that right and like it's about distilling it to the simplest like core of what the truth is and what that piece of knowledge is and making it so that literally anyone can understand it and I think that that's what I happen to be good at somehow and also something that's just really important for disseminating knowledge especially on like such a massive scale that we have access to communication in this day and time with internet and technology and that's something that 
our ancestors did not have access to that is a huge uh, back to the double-edged sword thing right <laughs> right the internet's such a beautiful and monstrous thing and i we can use that to our advantage uh, but they also can't our oppressors can too i mean that's the whole thing with like um the superhero stuff is like you know <laughs> the people we're fighting also have superpowers um but yeah yeah at least uh if we can i don't know it's all community building coalition building it all just keeps coming back to all of that right yeah no exactly that's that's a uh, that's perfect i uh i uh i loved uh all the stuff about different generational stuff and all of that and whatnot because it's like yeah even old people can old elders can learn and they can grow and learn from different things and past experiences and other things and whatnot and can learn from kids and youth can learn from old and whatnot and I mean like thinking like ever since I was a little kid like I mean I grew up in a I was born into like a <laughs> really fortunate household and got to I've, I've taught these guys a lot of things they've taught me a lot of things like it's been it's been very queer positive um but I've also you know like thinking about history with when talking about that like I have gone through so many different obsessions with eras and times pre uh anti-queerness mm -hmm. pre that when queer was just a normal thing <laughs> it was just mm -hmm. like a, just a chill thing that just happened in the everyday it was whatever yeah. like it was like the only reason that they ever were like, ah, maybe you as a guy shouldn't get with a guy was like, we kind of need to like repopulate. <laughs> that was like the only reason they were like, okay, you can do that for like the romance and like you guys like it's really cute, but like we need to like make kids because we're like dying. <laughs> it's like, it was like the future of humanity. You know? <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> they didn't um, have IVF back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just that double edged sword again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, yeah, that's the thing is like that delves also into with technology how we have it now is like you said like it's spread queerness a lot so many more people in the world learn have learned about trans people and queer people and just people of color and different things that they have to go through you know all the terrible stuff that happens in the world but on the other end of that like you said the shitty people also now have access to everything and yeah. they can spread their agenda as well online and they can spread their agenda to different corners of the world that didn't originally have that agenda and now they do so it's the double-edged sword like you said with online it's uh and it's good to have stuff like what you're creating out there as well to mm -hmm. fight yeah, against thank it you. so it's really great yeah i try <laughs> yeah and i love i love the internet i mean i it's what I care most about is intergenerational and getting rid of the yeah. social borders mm -hmm. between ages because it's the only way we're going to actually survive. And it's actually probably the only way we really, truly thrive yeah. is when mm. we work across ages and, and you know, an empire or, or the hegemony or the, the, the ruling class or whatever, capitalism, yeah. uh, the 10 monstered um being thing <laughs> that controls <laughs> systems yeah. really wants us to silo our movements and keep mm -hmm. them separate um along oh, yeah. age and everything and it's yeah i love that 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 at the core of why you do what you do i didn't realize i didn't realize that in that way so i'm glad you, you said mm -hmm. that. thank I'm you yeah, and, I, and i definitely didn't go into it thinking that mm -hmm. i was just like yeah. i went into it you know i mean i was a I went into like an undergrad theater program, like thinking I was going to be like a musical theater performer on the Broadway and uh, ended up falling in love with children's storytelling it through theater. And like, it was like the one thing that cast me when I was a freshman in college. And I just like, it just, it just hit something for me and I don't know exactly what it is, but it reminded me of like how I felt growing up with like Disney and Pixar movies. Like there's just something so, they're just like good children's storytelling really gets at just like universal truths. And there's something 
I don't know. This is the part of my work where I'm just kind of like, this is the thing that I fell in love with and it's led me on this path. Right. And like, while I was an undergrad, kind of like learning that craft, right. And focusing on that, I was also starting to understand my identity as a queer person. I didn't even touch the, my, the gender identity stuff back then. Um, we did take some very baby steps. Um, but I, I just, I wondered why those two things couldn't speak to each other. And I found that it really didn't exist at the time or really still, I mean, to an extent, I think, especially in theater, um, but also in larger mainstream media. I mean, I think that books have really made a lot of strides, I will say. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's a space that's really lagged. And I have all, always kind of came into it from like the children's storytelling perspective and then I honestly think over like the last like three or so years especially during lockdown I was just kind of like you know I can't it's one thing to make something for kids and hope that they'll find it somehow especially on like the internet as it is but I realized you gotta get parents on board you got to get adults on board and it can't just be like the queer and trans folks who are already there with you you gotta uh convert people i guess bring them in um let like get them to understand what we're about so that they can push it to their young people because they really this is like such a unique part about children's work is that you have these gatekeepers in front of you right and like that's first there are reasons for that I mean like especially in the world that we live in now I mean this is complicated right like you have kids are vulnerable right and like I talk about this in the book uh, that like you know we shouldn't want to protect children because they're like quote unquote innocent we want to protect children because they're vulnerable and because there are bad actors in the world who are trying to manipulate young people who don't have enough experience to discern a bad actor and in you know however many ways you want to interpret that and I think that I gotta convince parents and teachers and caregivers and all of the people that the book is for right this parenting idea that what I'm trying to say to young people is a good thing that's really important for them to hear that they have many possibilities of who they are in their life and how they want to live out their life and who they want to be that are beyond what they're being told and I think that that's a hard sell sometimes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think the book was the beginning of me trying to figure out, okay, how can I bridge the gap here? How can I sell better to adults? How can I get this to happen in spaces? How can I like create minions, right? How can I like, because I mean talk about this in the book too that like I am one person and I can be a public role model that's a persona that I play right that's a that's a role I take on but I'm still always just going to be one person and if you're talking if I am in a relationship even parasocial with a parent a kid and me on the screen I'm still not the most important person in that room for, to a child by any means and I got to get that person to understand why I'm on the screen in the way that I am and why I'm presenting that information and help them understand how to do it themselves as well. Um, and like, that's how exponential growth happens, right? It's just a math equation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was awesome. Uh, yeah. And so much more. Yeah. There's a mm -hmm. lot of care and beauty put into the work you do. Yeah, yeah. exactly. That was awesome. That was beautiful. And then you want to get into the phobia versus yeah yeah, yeah. I think the that's next yeah. really the, important yeah anti versus phobia the whole so. house had to hear me and I go oh my god listen to this yeah you went on a whole thing about it it was really great <laughs> oh good Never good using good phobia again anyways yeah please share <laughs> yeah totally so I started switching from um the suffix phobia so like transphobia uh, homophobia etc cetera, etc cetera, um to anti um, as a prefix, so anti-trans, anti-queer, anti-gay, etc. 
um, I think a couple of year, maybe a year or two ago. It's it's still relatively new for me, and I also um, I also definitely still use transphobia, homophobia, especially because they're like more legible as concepts sometimes. Um, but the reason I do it is because. <sighs> Bigotry is not fear-based. It's about oppression. It's about power. It's about... Uh, I probably put it so much more eloquently <laughs> in the book. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's... Fear can be rationalized. Like, fear is an understandable relatable emotion we can understand why someone might be scared of a spider because a spider you know some spiders are poisonous and can kill you if they bite you like that is a understandable fear we know we don't want to die most of us and especially not by spider bite but like a person is not the same as a poisonous spider a person's sexuality a person's gender identity specifically like those are identifiers they, they are parts of a person they are not someone who's going to murder you because of that right like that is so it it, it doesn't make like linguistic logical sense to call a bigotry a, a bias a way of thinking about someone a fear because fears are understandable bigotry i think is not in the same way that 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 is amazing that made me think about how um you know the saying of like it wasn't the gun that killed you it's the person holding the gun it's like mm. um oh you know oh if 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 you're afraid of people you're afraid of people but you can't be afraid of their identity you can be mm -hmm. afraid of like just because a killer is gay that that doesn't mean that they're a killer because they're gay they're, they're yeah just, they're just a killer because they're a killer like what else do you yeah. know so having yeah like, putting the identity into a fear is not at all the same thing exactly yeah mm -hmm. and conflating those things is, is dangerous yeah because yeah. and it's because it's actually hate too, it's right hate, yeah. and it's um, and it kind of reminds exactly me exactly just anti. Yeah, one of my big like I'm not on social media anymore, but one of the things I was really upset with is is the word pedophile, um, mm -hmm. pedophilia, because mm -hmm. philia literally means to love something. Mm -hmm. Um, that has it has like zero thing, nothing to do with. No, love. these people hate kids. <laughs> these people like, just hate kids. You know, there's like it's it's so violent. Um, and I it's yeah. just but the power with language, yeah. So I really appreciated that section and. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I sent a, a picture of it to the whole Brown at Futures crew on our Slack and said, let's make sure that we only use anti. So thank you. Really spread so you it. spread that seed already. Good, 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 yeah. good. Amazing. Yeah, I love that's it. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Already making a difference. Yeah. Thank <laughs> yeah. you for that. Exactly. So important. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The next thing is the topic with intersections between sexism and anti-gay stuff and with connecting mm -hmm. to trans. And I want to talk, yeah, I want to talk about one. that because mm -hmm. um i'm trans mask um mm -hmm. i've been on testosterone like i i pass pretty well mm -hmm. um and i noticed that because i pass well you know like i i've realized how me getting misgendered i still will get misgendered and it's not because i mm -hmm. look like a, a girl mm -hmm. it will be because i'm dressed feminine mm -hmm. or i have long hair cis boys get misgendered because they have long hair or I will literally just be hanging out with my friend that's that's really feminine presenting and people just assume oh only two girls hang out not a boy and a girl they can't do that until mm -hmm. they see my beard and then they get well then they think I might be trans femme then they get really confused mm -hmm. um so I wanted to talk about that because I've noticed that as well and so many other my friends and whatnot like they won't get misgendered if they're presenting mask and then they will if they're presenting femme and it's not because mm. they look like a girl and they don't pass it's because of sexism and anti-gay and it's totally that you know a cis man who's queer dressing really feminine will dressing in a dress people will assume he might be trans femme and misgender him you know 
So Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about that because it's, it's a thing that I've noticed so much in my life and there are transphobes. It's real. That is a thing. And, but some of these people, they can't exact, they can't just know on the spot if you're trans or not. (laughs) They couldn't just see me and know that I'm trans or not. So every day this person cannot discern a trans person. (laughs) Yeah. So (laughs) uh half the time it's not transphobia it is not active trans or anti-trans like it's not active anti-trans it's not that they're seeing us and are being anti-trans and are just like i'm gonna go be anti-trans to that trans person Mm -hmm. there it's sexism and other things and sometimes it's literally just accidental assumption that you just you say hey actually no i'm a boy then they'll just be like oh okay I've never, I Mm -hmm. didn't know the the, the, the way you dress, whatever, you know, which is still not great, but you know, it's just a conversation I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, It's super meaty and complicated. And I think a big part of it too is understanding. um, I think what you're, there's so much to get into. The thing that's like first sparking for me that I want to kind of get into with it is that what you're talking about of like cis people discerning transness like I think you're right I don't think that like the everyday normie (laughs) cis person walking around can has the has the discerning eye to spot a trans person just like walking down the street but I do think that is that statement is not true when it comes to trans women Um, I think that trans misogyny is where public transphobia, anti-transness happens because of the uh, visibility of trans women and trans femmes that is so violent and fear-mongered. And I mean, uh, just everybody just go watch the documentary Disclosure and like that will give you... (laughs) <laughs> that will give you like the the lesson you need in that and like the horrific portrayal of trans women throughout film history in particular um but i think when it comes to trans masculinity and thinking about misogyny because i mean i'm i'm non-binary and trans masculine um i am i have had top surgery but i have not been on i'm not on t and i get mis i mean i'm misgendered constantly because nobody knows how to perceive non-binary in the world but like also do i want people to do that i think when i'm walking my like i've heard uh, the way i like kind of talking about this and the way that i've heard others talk about it is like what's your grocery store gender um what's your like perceived gender out in the wild right and like for me i've the th- i mean like i would love my grocery store gender to be they them but that's probably not going to happen too soon um unless i get like a really cool gen z queer kid who's checking me out (laughs) on the grocery store and like that's when it's happened which has been great um but i think um oh train of thought where are you what happened to you um I was talking about grocery storage. Oh, what I'm going for is like general confusion at this point. Um, (laughs) That's where I feel like most satisfied in like other people's perception of me. Um, I get surged sometimes and that's fun. Um, I don't love getting she heard. That's not fun. Um, But also like I'm, we're all still on an ever continuing journey of gender. That's not like I I don't have an ending place for that or any thing I necessarily like want that to be eventually and that's just uh, a thing to think about but um getting back to it um sorry end of the day for a neurodivergent brain <laughs> means <laughs> lots of um threads um so yeah I think that it's complicated because I don't know I'm not a binary trans man but a lot of binary trans men that I know aren't men and therefore don't by the definition of the word experience quote-unquote misogyny right but a trans man has been socialized as a woman and uh, as female and went through probably most of their childhood depending on who you are and what kind of good or bad parents you had you know good bad not being a good binary um 
uh that's complicated um but probably went through their formative years experiencing misogyny for most of their life and that just makes i mean it's the same thing too for like i mean i i can't speak at all for trans women this is where i like point to like uh, incredible trans women who's spoken on like jules gill peterson is incredible um uh, raquel willis janet mock laverne cox just like all of these all of these incredible people who've spoken on this like uh, and are very very smart about this but you know trans women are socialized generally as men but like are but the toxic masculinity of that culture um is incredibly harmful and damaging and violent and so it's a it's a talking about trans misogyny is a very different conversation than trans masculine people experiencing misogyny um and this is just so complicated there's just so much to it because like also you were talking about passing and like well for me like I don't know what it means to pass as non-binary that's just like not even a thing right but like getting but like someone who presents and is generally perceived as cis male when you're a trans man like is so different when you're getting misgendered as female oh man I don't even know where to go because it's just it, <laughs> yeah. it's this I mean this is also just like an ongoing conversation in community. Oh 100 percent yeah it's a conversation yeah. I have every day. Yeah uh, I really yeah. liked uh, all the different things that you said though and they were all yeah they all made really good points and yeah no definitely like I when I speak on this stuff I can never speak on trans women's yeah. like and I mean like I said like what I end up getting though is I do get I've had a lot of people think I'm trans femme I've had a lot of that mm-hmm. and then why I get misgendered is I get mm. I, they they think I'm they're misgendering me as male they think they are but then I'm like ah. actually you're right that's <laughs> and it's such like a, a yeah it's ugh. such a complicated thing um yeah just like thinking yeah. about like people's perception of you but then mm. also like how you're performing your gender to the world yeah, exactly and and like how you were socialized and how that and how that influences your behavior and yeah. then also like how the whoever is in like the gender power of that moment right is like like what kind of power they have over you if be it physical if it's a what kind of relationship that is uh, even if it is a stranger who's just taller than you right Mm -hmm. and like how especially trans guys and 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 trans masculine people who are generally on the shorter side right? oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right? yeah, i deal with that yep exactly and it's just uh it's it's so tough because i don't really think that there's an agreed upon like term for it right because i am not a woman and yet i do experience misogyny because i am perceived as female light by a lot of people who interact with me in my grocery store gender right yeah, and just, that the grocery store gender is great yeah right <laughs> right isn't that great? i've been I called can't... sir and it was like the best moment of my life in a grocery store when i was uh first coming out i was like me and my friend actually got uh, we were both trans mask and i we've had mm-hmm. someone in the store be like are you guys brothers and we were both like oh my god <laughs> we were like you years. yeah we were like 15 we were like so excited <laughs> oh my god that's amazing i love that yeah, yeah it's it's really complicated and Mm -hmm. like it's because like there because in so many ways like trans masculinity has and it's so hard to like not compare trans masculine to trans feminine too in this conversation but they're just so different because like there is a privilege to trans masculinity right because you're not Trans masculine folks are not a f- perceived threat to the patriarchy in this in the same way that trans women are and trans femmes are because we're not we're in the like scale of power within gender norms, right? Like we're moving up we're trying to like theoretically this is all just like yeah um 
we're like moving from you know femininity and, and like cis women trans women are i don't know maybe this is a me being maybe i'm being problematic talking about all this in this way but I, I probably am but this is like it's it's complicated um so i'm just we're we're working it out as we're talking because you know as you move away from any kind of femininity feminists even even like butch cis, cis women like you're not targeted with misogyny in the same way because you're There's part of like the sexualization of women and femininity that's in there. There's like what is like the root of like misogyny is like this like anti femness, right? And like that's different than like a woman who is butch or masculine. And there's something like invisibilizing about that move toward masculinity when you like. Start- I don't know, start in a feminine space or socialize in like a beginning feminist, feminine, feminine way. And you're kind of like moving toward this like ultimate power, which is like cis, like masculine men, right? And like the like epitome of like toxic masculinity. You're moving toward that. And that's not threatening to them because you're not, no matter what you do, You will never be in that space. You will never be in that space safely, right? Um, And because you weren't born into it and you have to be born into it, right? And trans women are kind of giving that up, right? They're leaving that space. And that's what those big macho men are so terrified of is like any kind of threat to their own cis masculinity. And... I don't I just don't think that they're threatened by trans masculinity in the same way. Yeah. I agree. Your first thing. Well, I mean, you, Liam's always talked about this and I've always appreciated it and it's a nuance that I, yeah. I think it's beautiful that you um I hear what you're saying that we're getting into some very nuanced, complex stuff very. and um and everyone will have their own opinions on we, oh, yeah. like in our family like uh, Liam uh, Lee's brother Zach who's a cis male but very mm-hmm quite feminine um and was effeminate effeminate I, mean, yeah. I would say more yeah. than yeah that's the word um and was definitely bullied for it and 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 um, he was misgendered as a kid yeah a always hair. always seen as queer um mm. and and, he, and like not just super cis het <laughs> has autism yeah. so like presents mm-hmm. in different ways but um and Liam ha- Liam talks about how he has more masculinity just mm-hmm. externally than Zach and oh out in the world it's like yeah. I I I get less of the looks of like, mm-hmm. oh, that's a, a feminine yeah. person. It's like my... there's like mm-hmm. more, po- you almost have willed more power in this Even nuanced shorter, way. Yeah. yeah Zach has had the privilege of patriarchy that goes way back. Like when we were at the park, when they were young, Zach yeah. always was asked what he was thinking and what he was doing. Mm. Liam was always remarked on his behavior mm. and what he looked like and his clothes. Yeah interesting and I, it, like across the board i never we never ran into any adult who didn't do that one of those two things huh. so that's like some extreme like it's a testimony but i was very plugged into it and very aware mm-hmm. of watching that happen. and that's what the book is trying to yes. disrupt is <laughs> even just those behaviors from adults yeah. of how they are treating young people and trying to like dismantle the way we gender young people so sorry yeah i didn't mean no 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah it's great yeah and then i uh, yeah all right i also wanted to talk about with uh what you were talking about and like you know we were talking about the patriarchy and yes. men and all that <laughs> um power, power. Um, Slash the hetero patriarchy yeah uh, <laughs> yeah um but i also yeah i was like i was also th- reminded about how like being trans mask i mm-hmm. and so many other trans mask people also and then we go into the conversation of TERFs and all that part of yeah. it and how I have a hard time feeling safe in both washrooms. I don't feel safe in men's. I don't feel safe in women's because yeah, I, even though I pass, uh, actually me passing as a man, I don't feel safe in men's because I just don't feel safe around cis men. But yes. then I can't go into the women's because everyone's going to yes. give me side eye and freak out because it's a, I look like a cis man. Yes. And I think like that is 
another nuanced conversation that is a part of this as well. The conversation oh of TERFs and For their sure. damage to trans mask and trans femme people. And I, as a trans mask person, have dealt with a lot of the fetishization. Fetishization. Mm. That's my speech practice, yeah. <laughs> um, I have, I mean, trans women have this too, of just mm-hmm. being trans, the fetishized, fetishized about me and my identity and I've Mm. especially a lot of cis women I've had they feel like they can be more touchy with me Mm. and can be more like up in my busy blah 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 blah, you know whatnot because oh I'm there's there's anti-trans stuff caught up in there as well as weird fetishized stuff of like yo you're a trans you're trans so like I can still be near you because you're technically still a woman and like I get I've gotten that so much as when I was first coming out it comes down to genitalia which yeah. is gross exactly yeah. exactly right that is exactly what it is i don't have top surgery yet too i just I, mm-hmm. like it's full on like who cares if th- my face mm-hmm. seems to pass it's like to these to a lot of cishet women they feel like they can be really close and with me and all these mm-hmm. ca- and all whatnot because oh i'm not a cis man so it's fine but it's like mm-hmm. <laughs> but i'm uncomfortable <laughs> yeah but then there's also the Touch like people gen- non-consensually yeah. Ever. <laughs> oh god yeah i mean there's also just like the like gender traitor stuff of it all too yeah. right of the like um you i and i and i feel this sometimes from like cis queer women in particular um where it's uh you know like oh like Lynn's is like uh, there's like a leaving femininity behind kind of thing like leaving um I, it's so hard to put into words because I it's just something that I so ex- and this is like not where my like work is in these like I mean I think about all this stuff obviously like I have to be thinking at a really high level in order to be able to do the like 101 stuff that I do um but I I don't always um have to articulate it (laughs) and uh when I do I'm usually told like you're probably explaining this to a cis person like I had um I can't probably speak to specifically about it but I just had uh, a consulting I do consulting on like mainstream kids media and stuff like that and I just had a really really interesting consulting gig the first like kind of like good like interesting in like a good way um consulting gig that I've had because a lot of them are just like emotional labor um which is why I don't do a lot of them anymore um but it was it had to do with this like tv spot about a business run by a trans girl and her dad and their um, audience for their business is other trans girls but the spot is on a national television thing and uh cis people are probably the majority of the audience for that spot so the way that they speak about their business had to be shifted so that it could accommodate a cis gaze right and that was a really complicated thing to have to say in an email to an executive (laughs) about how to change just like tweaking some of the visuals on the spot um because of some of just because of the nature of that business and the way that it speaks to other trans girls is like you know if this was an ad for that was aimed at a mostly queer audience, especially a mostly trans audience, I would have been like, yeah, this is awesome. Go ahead. Maybe tweak this like one narrative thing. You're good to go. But this, I had to be really discerning and say, okay, we've got to take out this B-roll because it insinuates this. And it, yeah, having to explain like the difference between the trans gaze and the cis gaze to an executive <laughs> was uh was a different skill so, so sorry that's just why I'm saying like I'm thinking oh, aloud in a lot of this and uh this is all nuanced stuff that um I'm maybe not as articulate about as I usually am because this is so meaty and like is uh I mean I love being able to talk about this stuff because I don't get to usually and it's so complicated yeah and, it's great and, I like that yeah 
able this to is talk how about people it. really get it. I mean, people really get moved by story. So yeah. I appreciate oh, yeah. that. Yeah, it's awesome. I appreciate your vulnerability. Yeah. I, I have these conversations every day in my house. So I'm excited to talk about it <laughs> on the show. And just, uh, I mean, <laughs> it really sparked when you mentioned the uh, gender traitor thing. Mm-mm. That is like that I've I experienced, especially after going on testosterone. Like the mm. testosterone is what really affected the traitor thing for yeah. a lot of people. And like it just like taking that medical route. It's like, oh, you full on just you're like you're just full on leaving you're not a little girl anymore oh no i'm so you know like it's like it's yeah like so you've many. left the like feminist fight that we're all in yeah but it's and like, like it's like <laughs> no i'm like i'm a them... trans person <laughs> yeah, it's like can you like... go back and read your bell hooks because you're really internalizing some serious patriarchy with these statements yeah you yes. you <laughs> the yeah there is uh mm-hmm. the <laughs> yeah. fem- feminists are only cis women it's like uh nope <laughs> yeah that is not at all what it is well Uh, then that circles all the way back to the conversation that started that the question that started this right is that like do trans masculine people experience misogyny and like my answer would be yes it's just a different flavor of it i guess but it's not trans misogyny which is an important distinction very much yeah 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 but it uh yeah definitely experience their own thing Nash the patriarchy the federal normal yeah patriarchy. even <laughs> cis het men are affected by it yeah mm-hmm. so it's uh it's not great yeah <laughs> sorry what am i doing next <laughs> how are you doing we just have like our the three questions that we kind of ask everybody yeah i'm now. doing great we're just pivoting um cool sounds um, good um i know we could just talk uh we'll have to have you back um <laughs> so to that's hang out yeah. Yeah. you because i'm not doing yeah this. okay Great. I have another thing. Wow. I know. Sorry. We can ch- switch them. We can switch them. Sure. Okay. Um, okay. So this is, we get to get into my favorite topic. Trust. Um, and I'm just, yeah, we kind of were uh, anchoring this season in this, the whole idea of trust and what it means to show up with trust, to trust yourself, to trust your, your path, your mission in life, why you're doing the mm-hmm. things you do. And so we're, we're just asking our guests, um, how does trust animate your life? Where does it show up? Where where are the growth edges? All that Ooh. good stuff. Yeah, you're talking to a Scorpio son. So <laughs> trust is uh, certainly a thing for me. Um, I think I've always had trust in myself and in the direction I've wanted to go in my life and like instinctually that, that's a very instinctual thing for me and I haven't always been right about the exact thing that I've been going toward but I've gone toward it nonetheless and it's led me down different paths right and so the you know the the language around it has maybe changed but it's always been the same kind of trajectory and I think that there's something about that specific kind of trust in myself that I also think is just very stubborn um, <laughs> um, and just very um, focused and uh, yeah, really focused um, and I think has gotten me to where I am. Um, so I think I've always had a lot of trust in myself um, trust in other people is much harder to come by. Um, I, um, yeah, it's tough because I think I just, uh, I mean, the whole point of the book, right. Is that like, I wish that my parents had this when I was like, my mom was pregnant with me. And I think as I've grown up, I think people but also the world have betrayed me in really profound ways and it's been really really difficult to build that back and and I think and I can think about that on like a a larger scale in my life of like my gender identity and my sexuality and my neurodivergence and the difference between what I was told about myself and what I've had to discern was not true about myself and like what actually is 
how can I dig for that truth? And who can I trust to tell me the information that I need to know about myself? And ultimately, it always comes back to like, I am the only person that I can trust about myself, right? And I, I think strengthening that trust in particular has helped me trust other people because then I can set manageable expectations for other people. And what I can trust them to tell me is accurate question mark um so yeah i mean this is trust in like a really nebulous kind of way of looking at trust which i like um but it's uh i think i'm always i think i've had to learn to be more skeptical um is is a big part of it too because i do a lot of work in systems change like I do a lot of work in mainstream children's media. I do, I'm in all of these, diff I'm in TV film, I'm in publishing, I'm in, I don't know, this whatever like influencer industry is. Like I am in a lot of spaces that are just so riddled with, with bigotry and bias. And like, those are the bedrock of these spaces, right? And I think I'm a pretty, despite all of this, what I'm saying, I think I'm a pretty optimistic person, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I like to kind of see the sunny side of people and things, uh, or at least I um, like to put that energy out, um, which is there's a difference there. Um, but I do think I've had to understand who the real people are who I can trust and I who I can build things with because there's a difference there right there's a difference between okay like who is someone who's gonna cheer me from the sidelines and who is a person who is going to put in the blood sweat and tears to win this I don't know victor I don't want to be like game theory all of it but like that's a lot of it too like I'm playing a big old chess game with a lot of my career and it is so important to be able to discern who is a cheerleader who is someone in the stands who is someone who is on your team and who is someone who is helping you and is coaching you through strategically as well like all of those it's so easy to misinterpret who goes where um and for me, I've definitely trusted too quickly that someone is someone I've per had a role that I perceived them to have when actually they couldn't take that on for whatever reasons. And a lot of it is just anti-trans, anti-queer, anti-gay stuff that isn't always perceivable um, until you're like in the weeds with someone. Um yeah, I'm talking very metaphorically about very specific situations, <laughs> um, but hopefully that's that is a helpful way of talking about trust. I've had to learn to be more discerning in my trust, which has been hard. Yeah, no, totally. That's beautiful. I love it. I think it's really important. I always distinguish the difference between the trust you build over mm. a long time with somebody who does show is showing up and isn't in competition with you at all. There's just it's just yeah. supersedes you. You don't abandon they don't you don't have to abandon yourself to earn that trust or anything like that. That that's a different kind than like, yeah. the everyday walking through the life. But I think you nailed it by saying it begins with yourself. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if you always trust yourself, you're then it's it's gonna always be okay well even you know, if you trust yourself and then even falling into accidentally trusting trusting the wrong person you can still fall fall back on <laughs> yourself mm -hmm. and move on from it and trust that okay that was a bad moment <laughs> need to move on <laughs> you know yeah instead yeah I of think falling into a bad headspace because of it yeah I think ultimately I've always trusted myself it's just been, uh, it, I just always haven't always been able to interpret it, right? right? Like when I was a young person, like confused and depressed teenager, like struggling with my identity and like not understanding who I was, like I trusted that feeling, right? That like I was unhappy. I didn't know why. I didn't know what was causing the unhappiness I didn't know where in myself 
that was coming from necessarily, but I knew that feeling was a true feeling that I felt at like the core of who I am. And I didn't know how to do anything about it (laughs) Um, because I didn't have any answers and I'm the only person I trust, right? And uh, that's a tough place to be in where like the only person you trust is yourself. Um, and I've learned to grow that like inner circle for sure. I've, I'm have a wife who's like my best friend and we have two dogs and I trust them <laughs> for the most part. Um, maybe, I don't know, we have a puppy, so I trust him maybe 30% and I trust our older dog, maybe, uh, 80% on a good day. <laughs> um, <laughs> Love but, it. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Animals, right? Animals is a great part of life. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Grounded Futures platform is based on the idea of thrivistance, a thriving now while resisting and surviving amid hard times and the horrors. So we'd love to hear some of the ways you cultivate thriving in the everyday. Ooh. Um I think for me it's about oh, Ooh, this is a good question. Um it's sometimes it's easier. Uh, some days are easier than others. Um I think especially when it comes to like neurodivergent burnout, um I'm right now, I happen to be in a moment where I haven't been burned out for a while. Um, And I think that that this is like the longest stint I think I've had in a very long time where I haven't felt burned out, um, which is very nice. So I think in these kinds of spaces where I'm in, when I'm not in that kind of like depleted headspace, um, it's about just kind of like the simple pleasures, right? Of like, I love to cook like that's like like I love like I love food like I love like a nice restaurant (laughs) where I can like you know just like enjoy a glass of wine and like a beautifully cooked meal (laughs) from someone who wasn't me sometimes but then also like getting to be creative in like a very different way than I usually am um it's I think that something that I'm good at that's helped me in my work and my career is that I'm I'm good at building relationships with people who care about who I am and what I do and and why I do it like you lovely folks um and I I take pleasure in that. Like, that's fun for me. Like, this conversation is great. I love doing this. Like, that's why I was saying, like, end my day with a podcast? Absolutely. Yes. Um, and I mean, part of it's also like uh, my Leo moon wants to just hear m- me talk about myself all the, <laughs> all the time. But uh, it's, but like, that also is like a way that I fill myself up, right? Like performance has been a part of my life since I was a young kid. And that's because it fills something in me. And, you know, I, I, I teach and I, and I perform, I sing every, you know, a lot of the week. And like, those are things that I do that just make me feel good. And like, are part of the day to day of my life and I've woven those things in in a purposeful way and like yeah sometimes creativity can be hard but I also think like there are things that I've made sure not to monetize in my career and I think maybe if I wanted to leave all this behind I would maybe go to culinary school but like that's not this lifetime right and uh I need to keep some things a little sacred to myself and it's been, I need to do that purposefully sometimes um, because capitalism asks you to give all of what you can do to the system. Um, And for me to thrive, it's really important for me to have spaces where, I mean, I'm like a super introvert and like, (laughs) um, that's uh that's just something about me that um I really need those spaces to replenish and like watch 
trashy dating reality television <laughs> and <laughs> like just like turn off my brain for a little bit and that's um those are all ways that I thrive I love that distinction about um that thriving exists in some of the areas where uh isn't public facing isn't yeah. about how you make money um I really relate oh yeah 100 percent. and so many of the things I do I'm like I am really obsessed with playing video games and I also draw and it's like, oh, I could go to school to learn about how to make video games. I could go to school to learn how to draw. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm going to keep that no, <laughs> I'm gonna keep it it. to myself. <laughs> if I do want to learn how to do those things, I can probably watch something on YouTube and learn my own way and not go to school. Yeah, exactly. I want to keep them and not saying that school's bad and, and that learning how to do these things. So many people, they thrive off of that and they yeah. want to do that. But for me personally, it's not. Yeah. You have that cool self-awareness. It's neat. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for that. Disney. I love these two questions always garner different answers. And I just, mm. it shows like, you know, just shows how um, we could have a different conversation. The possibilities them. are just so massive. Like, yeah. They're not, it's, things aren't marginalized down to like a one way for everyone fits everybody. And it just shows up constantly in the, how people show up and answer these questions. So yeah. Yeah. Yay. Um, our kind of final question is we like to ask for recommendations. We usually like orbit around the conversation and recommendations. Mm -hmm. So besides mm -hmm. your wonderful work, um, your show and your book. Um, yeah, like we like to think about we have um because of Uli, we have a lot of younger folks who listen to the show. Um mm. And uh, so like, you know, maybe for young folks who are maybe mm -hmm. facing a hard time around the, these issues that we're talking about of anti-trans, anti-gay, anti-all yeah. anti that, um, some media that they could look to either, it doesn't, every, any kind of medium um, we're open to hear about and just yeah. any recommendations that maybe helped you along the way. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time with books right now but I was a really big reader when I was a young person and I love a queer YA novel like any there's such good stuff now like the like that just did not exist when I was a teen um so yeah <laughs> all of those books I especially really loved um Felix Ever After by Case and Calendar is beautiful. Um, anything by Johnny Garzavia, I think is their full name. Um, I might have to look that up. Um, beautiful um, Texan queer teen representation. Um, Latine. And let's see. Stuff for teens. You know, I don't generally work with teens a lot, so I don't have a ton of stuff off the top of my head. For anybody. Stuff... It could be any age. Yeah. Right? I mean, okay, okay, so okay. many of my teen friends are like into kids shows and into. Yeah. They grew okay. Up on that, great. so they watch that stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, I'm sure I'm just like preaching to the choir here, but like Steven Universe is one of my like just all time favorite pieces of art. Um, I. F this is like the thing is, but as soon as someone asks you can, for a recommendation, your mind just like goes completely blank. Um, I have really gotten into astrology over the past couple of years and absolutely adore the Channy app from Channy Nicholas, um, who is just fantastic. Um, she's just kind of like my go-to like astrologer person um, and has I've gotten like information from like a lot of different places, but, and, and, um, any, if, if you're a writer, I also really love, um, Gina Cadlick's newsletter. It's called astrology for writers and it's just really wonderful. Um, I, I really love those kinds of things. Um, I love the season of A League of Their Own, the remake, the reboot. I love like a historical fiction thing. Um, and I thought that was just beautifully done. Um, uh, there's just like a lot of really good queer stuff that's been happening despite all of the awfulness of the world. There's just good queer art that's out there because we are brilliant. And... <laughs> um, and I just want everyone to give us money. 
um, to make cool things. That would be the dream, right? <laughs> um, yeah, those are the things that come top of mind of like things that like I love and like some of the things that are like in my day to day as well. And um, uh, what else? Yeah, I feel like those are those are some good places to yeah, start. You know, it was great. Yeah. yeah, I liked I liked hearing Steven Universe because I I Ugh. I grew up on watching that. I watched that when it was first coming out when I was a little Ugh, tiny, and gosh, I'm yes. currently showing it to my partner. So we've mm. been I've been rewatching it with them. Ugh. They've never seen it. So it's, oh my gosh, I need to do a rewatch. I know, oh I know it's been so much fun. <laughs> It also <sighs> reminded me how I haven't seen the show yet, but I've never made recommendations on this, but um, it was just thinking like um, with kids shows that also are queer and stuff like that. There's that show going around right now called Bluey. I don't know if you've oh, seen Oh, Bluey's great. I yeah. don't know if it's queer, but uh, Bluey's Yeah, really not good. queer, but it's like, it's not- Quality uh, children's television. Yeah, yeah it's, I it's haven't- It's just like really beautiful. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet, but- everyone it's really lovely season. and fun and like well written and mm -hmm. it's just like this really lovely family unit and like each episode has like a nice clear structure it's just like really i haven't watched like all of it but like if you're looking for this is like the thing that i'm always about like if i'm like talking to like a parent with like a young kid i'm like okay here are all the preschool recommendations because like it's so easy to go i'm not gonna like i can't like shit talk a lot of its media <laughs> publicly but um there's like some things that it's just so easy to go to as like babysitter television and i'm telling you that there's a lot better stuff out there um doc mcstuffins is like obviously a huge disney property but like also is like a great show um chris nee who was the showrunner of and created doc mcstuffins also has a show uh, also on disney called vampirina that i think truly is her best work it's gorgeous i love vampirina um she also has done a bunch of stuff and so christy is queer um like basically like the queer shonda rhymes of preschool television um she also has a couple of shows on netflix that are fantastic ridley jones um spirit rangers which is about a trio of indigenous kids who are like land protectors essentially um and it was done by an entirely indigenous cast casting crew um yeah it's like incredible that they put that together in that way um really really intentionally um uh, other preschool stuff um i mean like like blues clues and you like uh, i was very into blues clues when i was a kid um i got to sit in the chair once and i helped out with some of this content on their youtube channel um so i've written i've written for blue which is extremely cool um <laughs> so yeah i, um, I want to yeah, give a yeah. shout out for a little bear from marie send it um, yeah so many the poo I just really think that I'm also like I'm into like like less like in your face politics and just like young people being trusted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, like I mean the that, way that yeah. that that show is like it's just it's just it's otherworldly because yeah. everyone <laughs> trusts everybody. They're well, kind, that's that was mm -hmm. yeah curious, exactly right. gentle. Oh. Yeah, that's yeah. like a perfect also to like. I I'm I'm like <laughs> I'm biased because of what I like, but it's like Studio Ghibli movies. Are also oh, yeah. a really good choice. Actually, mm -hmm. there's just certain anime series that I think are good for kids. I hate that mm -hmm. idea that kids can't handle any of that stuff because there's like oh a couple oh, yeah. of serious topics. Sailor in it. Moon, I loved Sailor Moon. Pokemon would be fine for a little kid. Oh, <laughs> it's like that Pokemon. would be a lot of fun for a little kid to watch. And yeah, the Kiki's, deli Kiki's yeah, delivery Kiki's service. service. Yeah, oh, I favorite. watched when I was three years old, like stuff like Princess Mononoke, which is quite mm -hmm. violent. At a friend's house. At a friend's house. That was a bit. <laughs> It wasn't, yeah, it was not like, it's not like this was you guys letting me watch that. Um, but I watched it and it's like, I, I mean, it's different for every kid, but I, mm. I, I just think communicate with what your kid's like. Oh yeah. <laughs> Honestly, yeah, what yeah, does yeah. your kid want to walk, watch? Oh my God, like, ratings it, are such a sham. That's a whole They really are. I always got in trouble for um, following your guys' predilections and, and where you were at. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah just there's just so much media we will have all this in the show notes um including how do people can find you but um mm -hmm. is there, do you want to um can you please just maybe give a little quick 
uh, where we can find you. Where people Ooh, listening yeah. can find you yeah. that maybe don't read show notes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All the things. Um, you can follow me on socials at Linz Amer, L-I-N-D-Z-A-M-E-R. All of my work is just at Queer Kid stuff singular kid um and queerkidstuff.com is like where all of the stuff is uh we do a lot uh, we do things for parents we do things for educators we do things that are for kids and are just like content that you can bring to young people um since this is a podcast you can check out my podcast um rainbow parenting it's an expansion of the upcoming book um and you can pre-order the book anywhere you get books it's called rainbow parenting um my personal fave is bookshop.org, uh, but you can, yeah, wherever you prefer. <laughs> yeah, get that book, everybody. Ooh, Everyone yeah. should read that book. I actually think it's for everybody. Um, oh, yeah. Even the cishet. Queer, yeah. Really. Rainbow parenting for everybody. Yeah. Even if you don't have a relationship with a single child. Yeah. You encounter think, them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, everyone read it. Well, thank you so much for being on our show. This was, yeah, it was so, so much illuminating. Fun. And thank joyful. you for having me. I get excited yeah. getting to talk about it talk about my my stuff the stuff yes, that I always queer stuff of <laughs> no, it was stuff, great whatever I yeah. don't get to answer a lot of those questions because everyone's like oh let me talk about your work and I'm like yes I love talking about my work but like also I have other interests um yeah yeah 100 yeah, I like that we got to talk about the Magneto thing that was a lot of fun yeah. and just Disney and kids shows yeah. in general that was a lot of fun oh my gosh yeah oh, no okay. every all the time yeah, yeah thanks was, so much thank um, you so much for coming yeah of course know. thanks for having me I really appreciate it this is lovely Thanks for listening to our show. Grounded Futures is a media production and mentorship collaborative. And this podcast is produced by Carla Bergman, William Joy, Jamie Lee Gonzalez, and Melissa Sharp. And our sound tech is by Chris Bergman. Resources and transcripts for this episode are in the show notes. If you want to donate some funds or check out our other awesome shows, head over to groundedfutures.com or email us with comments and suggestions at groundedfutures at gmail.com. And please tune in next time to hear more from our incredible guests on how to thrive in the everyday.